the splendor of the sun, how dark the darkness was for him. How desperate the long terror of the first fall of night. Until Adam learned that day would come again. Could see that there is light and order in the universe. And then Adam began to see how much light remains in the sky at night. The stars and their enduring promise of the sun. The returning star of the day. Adam learned that the night is never wholly dark and that no night is endless. Even as each of us must learn it in our own times of trouble and darkness, the light is never far. So my question is for you, which one of those are you in the dark night of the soul? Are you the one that gets stuck in the darkness? Or are you the person that clings to the ever-present light? Emotional health is dependent upon our mental health, which we talked about last week. So what are some negative emotions? Let's, let's talk about negative emotions. And again, I want to clarify, this is not, uh, these are not emotions that are legitimate emotions after an event, a crisis, a tragedy, whatever, but these are emotions that people are stuck in, all right, that, that are chronic. What do you consider some negative emotions? Anger. Anger? Yeah. Guilt. Guilt. Living in the past. Living in the past. Fear. Fear. Jealousy. Always being the glass half full. Yes. Jealousy. I get the end of it. Mm -hmm. Anxiety. Jealousy. Jealousy. Depression. Uh, dissatisfaction. You think about dissatisfaction being a negative emotion? It leads to lots of other emotions. Uh, envy, bitterness. So negative emotions uh, indicate doubt, okay? Especially when we believe in a, in a God who loves us. Negative emotions create, reveal doubt. And so you, you have them, but you don't have to live with them. Do you think it's possible to live without negative emotions? That I'm here to know is yes. The answer to that is yes. All right. So let's see what the scripture says about our hearts. Somebody says Mark 7, 20 through 23. And he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man, far from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit. Licentiousness and evil time, blaspheming, uh, pride, and foolishness. All these things which come from within can be found the man. All right, Romans 1 21. <coughs> For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Hebrews 4.12 For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit, joints <coughs> and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So what does this tell us about our hearts? They're deceitful, right? They're not true. Uh, so that's the thing that we have to remember. Our emotions are representative of what's in our hearts as a rule. Brain research shows that every conscious thought that we have is recorded on our internal hard drive, known as the cerebral cortex. Each thought uh, scratches the surface. They are much like an Etch-a-Sketch. And so as the, uh, we have the same thoughts over and over again, that trace begins to deepen and deepen and deepen. And it's called, uh, cause was what they call a memory trace. So with each repetition, repetition as that trace gets deeper, if it is uh, tied to an emotion, then it, it, it's potentially stronger, exponentially stronger, all right? So if you have a thought that's tied with an emotion, that's why you cling to that so much longer than you do some other thoughts, because that emotion makes, it, uh, makes the trace deeper in your brain. So we forget most of our random thoughts that are not tied to emotion, but we retain the ones that do have the emotion tied with them. So we don't develop new responses until we have new thoughts. The thoughts are what we have control over. That's how we control our emotions. So uh, that's why renewing our minds is crucial, and that's why we keep talking about this. New thoughts come from new perspectives. And of course, the Bible encourages this because God created our minds, and he understands it better than anybody else. So, uh, just like we've been talking about in Romans 12, uh, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may know what the perfect will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect.
Scripture also teaches us that we can accept or refuse our thoughts. Instead of being held hostage by them uh, and old thought patterns, we can compare our thoughts, capture our thoughts, and then allow Christ's power to uh, change them. So that's in 2 Corinthians 10.5, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take thought captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. I can't control what happens to me every day, but I can control what I'm going to think about what happens to me. I can control what I say to myself. I have a choice to have destructive thoughts or constructive thoughts about what's happening right now. I can wallow in what's wrong and make uh, things worse, or I can ask God for better perspective to help me see good even when I don't feel <coughs> good. Uh, we gain new perspective and we have new ways of thinking. I can face things that are out of my control and yet not act out of control myself. That would be because I have a new thought about it. That would be my new memory trace and it would be my new pattern. Or you can't just say this and you can't just think it. You actually have to believe it. And in order to believe it, you've got to settle something in your heart once and for all. Either you trust God or you don't. That's the bottom line to everything. We, choose to, we have to choose to live on what God says above what we feel. That comes back to surrender, which we talked about last week. So we talk about surrender, and people say I'm surrendered, but let's make that a little more practical. Uh, <clears throat> surrender means I give up my right to whatever it is uh, that I'm clinging to, and it also means that I'm going to entrust God with uh, certain things, and I'm going to allow God to be who he is. So what are some rights that you think that we cling to that we uh, might give up? And they, these are good things. They're not negative things. But for instance, how about the right to our possessions? Uh, sometimes having clinging to that right puts us uh, in a bad emotional frame of mind. What else might, what other kind of right might you cling to? How about your, your reputation? Uh, Aren't we driven mostly by what other people are going to think about us? And so we have a right to have a good reputation, or so we think we do? How about to be accepted by other people? Now see, I can say, these are not bad things, to have a good reputation, to be accepted, but it doesn't mean that we have the right to do any of this. Once again, uh, I'm crucified with Christ, which means I'm a dead man. Dead men have no rights. So surrendering these rights shouldn't be that hard to do. How about the right to control the circumstances? That's a big one for most of us. Uh, can you surrender that right? Can you give up that right? Uh, how about the right to be successful? I'm not saying God doesn't want us to be successful, but that doesn't mean that we want to cling to success as a right. Because if we think it's a right, it determines how we're going to behave in order to uh, accomplish our right, to, to get what we think is our right. So uh, what are you going to entrust to God? What are you going to... If you're surrendering, now, this is an exercise for you to do, but it's an exercise for you to do with God, personally and privately, for him to speak to you about this. So what are some of the things that you can entrust to God? All of those things. All of those things, most of which would come under my will. How about your decisions in life? Uh, you know, some people think God gave you a brain to think, and he doesn't expect me to ask him what, how, what decision I should make. That's why he gave me a brain, so I can decide for myself what decisions I should make. What about uh, your emotions? Can you entrust God with your emotions? Can you choose to do that? That's when you choose not to have an emotion that's overwhelming you, and instead you're going to trust God with that. Uh, how about uh, your mate? Especially your mate who's not behaving the way you want them to. <laughs> Can you entrust your mate to God, or do you have to continually tell your mate what, you're, what they need to be doing? I'm sure none of you do that to all the parents you want for that. <laughs> How about our children? How hard is it to entrust our children to God? It's a big one. It is a very big one. Uh, but, you know, as you all know God's a better parent than any of us ever thought about being. Uh, and then how, what can you uh, allow God to be to you? In order to surrender, you have to allow God to be your deliverer. Uh, what else can he be for you if you're going to surrender? How about your provider? Uh, 
this, is, this process right here, you can kind of go through the characteristics of God. And if you've never done this, sometimes if you're just trying to praise God, you go through the alphabet. And for every letter of the alphabet, find a characteristic of God uh, that fits that letter just as a way to praise God. You can allow God to be your Savior. There are many things here, but that's just a, an example of a process for you to go through. Our guide, like the day for guidance. Yeah. Right, absolutely, our guide. Um, now, after you can go through this process and you can really see what surrender is going to mean to you. And it doesn't come quite so easily when you realize, I'm going to have to give this up. I'm going to have to stop having a pity party, or I'm going to have to stop trying to control my children, or whatever that is. Uh, it becomes a whole lot harder when you make when you look at that from a realistic standpoint. Most of the people have already done that. <coughs> You've already done what? Release the children. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> worry about it. You do worry about it, yes. <clears throat> we have photographic thinking, unfortunately, sometimes. Satan takes a snapshot of a very bad point in our lives, and then he helps us to believe that it's never going to get any better than that. Uh, and he does that by reminding us of our past and who we have been, what we have done, rather than who we are. Um, we have to remember, hurts are real, of course, and they're very painful. But when the hurt remains, the uh, God remains deep, God. And that's what you have to remember always. When the hurt remains deep, God <coughs> remains God. Uh, for that to be of comfort, we have to be able to trust the character of God. I want to read something to you that someone wrote on the character of God, and I am going to read it because I don't want to summarize it. It is an easy thing to trust our Lord when we feel his presence strongly around us. We have felt those moments in the midst of worship where we fear it, that if we get any closer with our Lord, we could not tolerate it anymore. We have felt his magnificent presence and know our hearts respond in joy to his nearness. However, as one progresses steadily along the path of Christian wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, we must progress to loving our Lord when he hides his face. Sometimes known as the dark night of the soul. I'm sure you've all experienced that. The hidden face of our Lord is all throughout his word. David in the cave, Job in his tragedy, Joseph in jail, Jesus on a cross. The common theme through the lives of all these men is that they were given wholly to following their Lord no matter what. When our Lord hides his face, do we trust that he will see us through? Or do we begin to think that he has forgotten our plight? Do we only trust our Lord when he makes his nearness known to us? Are we so selfish, so untrusting, so doubtful? If we truly know our Lord, then we know he can never leave us, as it says in Hebrews 13.5. If we truly know our Lord, then we know that all things work for our own good, Romans 8.28. If we truly know our Lord, then we know that he has never failed us, 1 Corinthians 13.8. If these things are true, and they are because the Bible cannot lie, then we must ask ourselves, do we really only love God when he makes his goodness known to us? Is our love for him unconditional? Or is our love for him contingent upon the fact that he always makes himself known to us? The Bible teaches us of the character of our God. It teaches that he is sovereign in all things. Because of this, we can trust our Lord when he chooses, for our own good, to hide his face from us. He does not leave us. He simply cloaks himself from us. We are taught to pray, thy will be done. God's will is to bring about a new heaven and a new earth of utter purity. As we go through the drought of God, then we become more able to pray for his will to be done because we know that this will bring us into eternal presence with him. The silence of our Lord causes us to physically ache for any morsel he can cast to us. To long for our silent Lord is the greatest testament of our love for him as a being, not a powerful God that can fill us with a feeling of happiness in our soul. We cannot be of any real use to God unless we trust him implicitly in everything all the time. That means we must study the character of our God. We must sear it into our minds so that on the onset of his hiding, we know that he is up to something for our own good. Our Lord is worthy of this level of total trust. He has proven himself a multitude of times. We must throw away our selfish need for good feeling presence and trust that he knows what he is doing with us. We must love him unconditionally. We must find joy in the sheer fact of God, not in his power. We must trust the character of God, not his presence. What that means is that we have to choose between the truth and the facts that are sometimes screaming at us, especially screaming at us with pain. If you think, uh, if <coughs> what, what happens to us is 
Um, uh, we have an experience in life. And this can be an individual experience, uh, an isolated experience. It can be a lifetime of experiences. But uh, we have an experience in life. As a result of this experience, we believe a lie. So let's say that this experience is something uh, of abuse or something as a child, either neglect, physical abuse, something like that. So as a result of that, we begin to believe a lie. The lie that this person would believe is along the lines of, I have to protect myself, all people are evil, uh, I'm not going to ever trust anybody, whatever those things are. The, the saddest ones are the ones who believe I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy, I'm not lovable. <clears throat> so we believe a lie, and as a result of that, we begin to defend and protect ourselves, or comfort ourselves. Now, for instance, one of the ways that we might do that is with anger, all right? Uh, I'm going to push people away before they can hurt me. I'm going to uh, let them know that nobody's going to bother me. We're going to intimidate them, whatever. So as a result of that, people respond to the way that we're behaving. And because this, this is not uh, a healthy process or a healthy action, this defense and comfort, the people responding, they don't respond positively either. So then we have another experience of rejection or whatever that is, and we believe more lies and we continue this. And this becomes our cycle of hurt in our lives. For some people, it goes on a lifetime. For some time, people, it goes on for a season. Now, of course, the solution to this is that first you have to stop believing the lie, which means that you have to know who you are in Christ and what is the truth of God's word. But this is the important part. Defending and comforting ourselves this is actually God's job, all right? So when we put ourselves in God's job to defend and protect ourselves, we develop a stronghold. That's how strongholds happen that they talk about in 2 Corinthians. So your stronghold can be anger, it can be fear, it can be depression, it can be whatever that is. And so the key is you have to... Uh, this is a sin to put yourself in God's job, to, to make yourself God, to make yourself responsible for protecting and defending yourself instead of trusting him. So you have to stop believing the lies and you want to break that stronghold. So one of the ways that you, want to, that you can do that is you have to repent of the negative, of, of the sin that's in your negative emotion. So let's just take anger for example. Uh, tell me some things that might make you angry. That, you can say things, and I know it's not you that gets angry. You just have seen other people do this, all right? So what are some things that uh, might make someone angry? Cutting somebody off and driving. Okay. Traffic. Road. Road yeah. rage. We'll go with road rage. All right. What else? Mm -hmm. Stupid. Stupidity. Absolutely. Rejection. Rejection. Okay, so we can go on with that. This, I just want to make the point here. So you want to make, whatever you want to uh, be set free from bondage of, whether it be fear, anxiety, uh, depression, anger, whatever it is, okay? Uh, you make a list of all the things that uh, make that emotion activate for you. And then you go back and you look at each individual thing and you identify what your personal sin is in this negative emotion. So for instance, road rage would be impatience, <laughs> among other things. <laughs> all right, it would also be judgment, it would also be control, it would be all kinds of things, all right? Stupidity would definitely be judgment, all right? We're not supposed to judge others. Uh, rejection, uh, I know it sounds like kicking, kicking somebody when they're down, but you cannot be, uh, be offended by something that someone else does to you unless you are first thinking about you, all right? So you're being rather self-focused there. Uh, so you see the point. If you just say every morning, I'm not gonna be angry today, I'm not gonna be angry today, I'm not gonna be angry today, you're just trying in your own self not to be angry today. But you're still in bondage to your anger. But if you repent of the sin that's in your anger, okay? Lord, please forgive me for my impatience, forgive me for all of these things, then you can be set free from the actual <coughs> anger because the reason that causes the anger is no longer in existence. 
Now, I'm not saying that's going to happen overnight, but it can, and it can happen. Uh, you may have to revisit that upon occasion. Give another example. Uh, who are shy people always thinking about? Themselves, right? But what does a shy person always say? Oh, I can't help it. I'm just shy. I can't do that. I'm just shy. So they're in bondage to being shy. But if they will instead repent of their self-focus and their self-centeredness, then they can be set free from being shy. So um, the thing that we always want to remember here is emotions are real for us, okay? They are real. But emotions are not truth. And that's the part that you have to cling to. That's the part that you have to hang on to. Another, um, I'm running out of space at that time. <laughs> but another thing that we have in our circle of life, we have uh, sins that have occurred. All right? So we have our circle of life here. And we have our sins that we commit. We have the sins that are committed against us. And then we have sins of the world. Now, what are we supposed to do with the sins that we commit? Repent. Right. What are we supposed to do with the sins that are committed against us? Forgive. Forgive. What are you supposed to do with the sins of the world? These are the things that just happen, you know, uh, accidents, car wrecks, weather, whatever. Right. Evil people, not specifically against you. What are we supposed to do with the sins of the world? Pray, Pray about them. Pray. Pray about them, but eventually, and ultimately, we have to grieve them, usually, and then learn how to move on. <clears throat> so, uh, the, in my experience, the people who remain victims are the people who are looking for justice. They can't let go of the past, they can't let go of the pain because they want and demand justice and so they remain victims. Instead, you can choose to be a wounded healer, all right? Because it's through our wounds that we can learn how to heal other people. So instead of being a victim and you've had experiences in your life, become a wounded healer instead. That's a choice that you have. One of the ways that we do this also is by praising to improve our emotional health. Uh, Isaiah 61.3 tells us to put on a garment of praise instead of a garment of heaviness, a garment of despair. Uh, we can learn to observe our emotions rather than be our emotions. Okay, in other words, even as simply as saying, I, uh, I am feeling sad, I am feeling anxious, as a, instead of saying that, say, uh, say that instead of I am sad, I am anxious, okay? So it's like your emotion is an inanimate object out there that you can observe and be aware of, but you don't have to take it on as your identity. Feelings, feelings work uh, much faster than our thoughts, and that's why you have to think about your you have to fight a feeling with a feeling. You want to replace a negative feeling with a positive feeling. Sometimes God gives us the gift of an incurable wound, as he did in, uh, with Joseph and his dislocated hip, because then it causes us to walk differently, which gives us a different perspective in life. I don't know that this will work at a distance, but can you tell which, which, of, which row of dice is on top? How many people are closer are going to see? Which one's on top? As you look at it, you can't see it, but some, you can look at it a certain way and this is the top row. You can look at it another way and this is the top row. And you can look at it another way and this is the top row. So it's all about perspective, all right? And that's what you have, that's what you have control over, always, is your perspective. Uh, <clears throat> there is a way to create positive emotion, right? Uh, and you do need to sometimes create positive emotion. All right, research has supports the concept that positive emotion or emotional well-being is different from the absence of depression or negative effect. So you can have positive, you can have negative, and you can have an in-between. So even if you don't have a negative emotion, you may need to create a positive emotion. Uh, positive emotion seems to protect individuals against physical declines in old age. So we certainly need to start focusing on positive emotion right now. Uh, so what are some things that you can do there? You can have um, goal revision. You know, I don't know at this age if we still have goals, but uh, whatever our goals are, they need to be reachable and they need to not be untenable uh, because if you have a reachable goal and you attain it, it supports a feeling of control. 
You can create positive moments by infusing uh, ordinary events with some positive meaning. So what do I mean by that? You know, have you ever stopped and thought about the fact that God gave us colors? You know, he could have given us a black and white world, but instead he gave us colors. And so just stopping and reflecting on the fact that we have beautiful color is infusing a positive meaning into an ordinary event. And what about a breeze? You know, God could have had no wind, or he could have had nothing but strong wind. But he also gave us a gentle breeze, which is pleasant. And you can infuse positive meaning into that event. For me personally, I have always looked at a breeze as, as God's Holy Spirit uh, speaking to me, breathing on me. Uh, I have a personal thing that I just do when I see a red bird in my front yard. Uh, that that's a reminder that God is present with me. That's him specifically saying, don't forget that I'm here. You get to make that choice. You can infuse a positive meaning on all kinds of ordinary events. Uh, focus on what really matters. And of course, all of us are old enough now, we've been through all those things that don't matter. And uh, we have to let go of the things that don't matter. A specific exercise that you, exercise that you can do is to reflect on uh, in a time in the last two days that made you feel particularly good, have a lot of gratitude, pleasure, some positive emotion. Then you close your eyes and you think about it. Who was there? What was happening? And then you sh if you can share that mood with somebody else, it amplifies that mood. Do that just before you go to sleep. And it doesn't uh, make the stress go away, but it does make it easier for you to deal with life. Uh, <clears throat> He talked about helping others. There's a concept of doing good in your darkness that's supposed that, that is supported by the scriptures. The more we look at ourselves, the darker we feel. And it's easy to get stuck in self-absorption in the midst of our thoughts and our struggles. So instead, if we will focus on the fruit of the spirit, which is goodness, and in that uh, for, in that scripture, good here refers to energized, expressing itself in benevolence, acting good. So it is the concept of doing good not of being good. And it's preceded by kindness in that list of the fruit of the spirits, which expresses a tenderness toward others. So this is an active participation for the benefit of others. Isaiah 6, 58, 10, and 11 tells us, and if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. In the New Testament, in 1 Peter 4.19, it tells us, So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Ephesians 2.10, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. <clears throat> Ephesians 6.9-10, The Law of Sowing and Reaping. Uh, we are told not to become weary. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Isaiah talks about the glory of the Lord being our rear guard.